Alrighty, Cherub. So today we're going to be talking about the Rococo and the Enlightenment. All right. So this is a one of another one of those moments when art goes <laughs> going when we're going back and forth between um, art made to a formula, thinky art versus emotional art, the Baroque. We're going back and forth between these two uh, poles, and then it just kind of goes off and becomes weird and pink. And that's what happens in the Rococo period. Okay, so art obviously is going to be influenced by change in society and the economic forces that cause that change. All right. At the end of the the Baroque period, okay, so the end of the 18th century, okay, we're going to be getting into um, what's called the Enlightenment, and that's a period of when new philosophies are going to start to be um, discussed and new roles in society are going to be discussed. Like how society should be organized um, is really going to be taken seriously by a lot of different thinkers across Europe. Um, science is going to become more important um, and, and, and its role within the bounds of, of society is going to be taken more seriously and that's going to affect art. Okay. Artists are going to become more prominent members of society. So we're going to, we're leaving that time period because of the Renaissance, because of the Baroque, we've, because of this age of geniuses, we're leaving that time period in which artists are seen as craftsmen. They're going to be taken more, much more seriously in society. Okay. And art movements are going to start to happen much quicker here on out. Um, you know, the Renaissance lasts, you know, two, you know, 200 years, the Baroque lasts a hundred years. Um, Rococo is going to be really, really short. And then as we move on, the neoclassical, the romantic, the other periods, they're also going to become shorter and shorter through the years. All right. If you are a working artist, you have to, you no longer um, become apprentice to a master. Excuse me. <clears throat> you no longer become apprentice to a master. What's going to happen is you're going to become, uh, you're going to go to the salon. Now, remember the Louis XIV um, when we talked about the Northern Baroque. And he's going to move the capital of art from Rome to Paris. And the way that he does that is he establishes the school, the salon. Um, it's the official way to become an artist. So you no longer have to apprentice, you know, become an apprentice and work for a master. Now you can go to school to do it. And the salon in Paris is going to become the largest, the oldest, the most prestigious of the salons. Other salons will open up across Europe, but the one in Paris is the biggest and the most uh, prestigious. Okay. So art's going to work less for religion and more for other institutions. Again, a, a, a product of the Reformation. So Rococo happens when Louis XIV dies in 1715. The court that he has assembled in Versailles, remember he's forced all the noblemen out of Paris and into Versailles and so he can keep his eye on them. They're going to flee back to Paris. Okay, they're like, well, well okay, that was fun. And they're going to leave, go back to Paris. The Nobility, the aristocracy is going to wax stronger in political power. The monarchy is going to be diminished. There's not going to be quite the powerhouse that Louis the Fourteenth was. Um, the Rococo style develops as a result of the taste of the French aristocracy. Okay, this nobility, this not royalty, but the nobles who are coming back to Paris and who want a lavish and luxuriant lifestyle. Okay. Rococo starts really small. It's a small art form. It's not like Baroque is very, very big and everything that it does is very theatrical and very large in scale. Rococo isn't like that. Rococo is small, but it is Baroque intensified. It's going to become a lot more, um, Baroque is, is, is full of details. Rococo is even more full of details just on a smaller scale. Okay. The word refers to the, the pebbles and the small shells that get embedded in the frames. Um, and again, this very, very ostentatious, this very lavish, this very rich, uh, 
decorative style. So again, it begins as this architectural style and then gets extended to uh, the other visual arts as well. It is seen as feminine, okay? And that's important to realize that it is seen as a feminine style because it is very flowery. It is very over the top. And it's very light colored. Uh, you'll see the pinks, you'll see the whites, you'll see the pastel colors uh, throughout today, okay? And the term that's associated with it is fete galant. Fete galant means kind of picnicking out in nature. It's rich people doing rich people things out in nature that's wild but nice. Um, a nature that is untamed, unspoiled, wild, um, but there's no like wolves in these woods. It's like sugar plum fairies, okay? And you'll see what I'm talking about. So again, the characteristics of the Rococo, it's got very sinuous organic lines. It's very curvy. Um, it's small and it's associated with furniture and interior design. Okay. And it reflects this arist aristocratic lifestyle. It is pastel. It is very light colored and it is feminine. Okay, so I'm going to link these two videos up here. The Rococo Puffs is <laughs> a humorous take on what the art of the Rococo and the life of the Rococo looks like. And it's just a humorous spoof on that. Um, the other one is talking about, and it's going to decorate, and it's going to show you how Rococo decorations look and the interiors of a Rococo room are going to look and how they're created. And they're going to use stucco. So the Baroque is going to start to use stucco and plaster to decorate on the ceilings and such. Rococo is going to take that and crank it up about 15 levels. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to link these two videos uh, in the description below so you can take a peek. Rococo Puffs, again, humorous. Uh, the this, this stucco is serious. Uh, when I got to go to, um, for a, I got to present at a national conference in Chicago a couple of years ago, and in the ballroom at the, the Hilton, they had this, it was very, it was Neo Rococo. And so I thought I'd include a photo of that. Again, lavish, over the top, ostentatious. Okay, so we've got two pieces with the Rococo, and then we're going to be looking at the anti-Rococo that's happening in Britain at that time. All right, so we're going to start in France with a picture that you've probably seen before, and this is called The Swing by Fragonard. Okay, 16, six, excuse me, 1767, oil on canvas. Fragonard's The Swing. And if we take a peek at this picture, we can see that, yeah, let's zoom in here. We can see there's a lot happening. Now you can see, now look at the, look at the background, first of all. You can see that it's in this French garden, okay? This woman is on a swing. Now look at this, these trees. They're like overgrown and really, really, <laughs> just i don't know just so wild and overgrown it's like the it's like the black forest in germany but like a fairy tale version of it um if she falls off that swing she's not going to snag her dress on anything she's just going to bounce i mean look at the look how soft and billowy these trees are okay these are like very i mean she's just gonna they're like clouds <laughs> We've got the, yeah the, these branches, these gnarly old branches, but the leaves are just again, it's so sinuous and so light and soft. Okay, now and that kind of is echoed in her frilly, very frilly dress here that is just swirling and billowing around her. Now what's happening in this picture? is that the she's on a date this girl is on a date with this guy back here and he's the one that again he's pushing her on the swing but he's the ropes are attached so he doesn't actually have to touch her because that is not appropriate okay so there she's on this swing her date is like is pushing her on the swing she's flinging her shoe off she's flinging her shoe off so it goes off into the the bracken into the the underbrush and in the rose bushes just below her 
is the guy that she's really there to see. And you can see that they're making eye contact. She really wants to be with him. And so he's hiding in the bushes there down below. And he's catching a glimpse up her skirt. <laughs> so this is a really saucy picture. This is a really racy picture. And you see Cupid, the statue of Cupid, over here on the left. And he's going, shh like watching like aha it's all about trysts and secret rendezvous and little affairs and it's very silly and light so the idea is that she's kicking off her shoes so that her date um will go off and you can see that he's he looks like a much older man that see he'll go running off into the bracken searching for her shoe so then she can canoodle with the young man over here for a few moments okay undisturbed that's the point of this picture it's very frothy hence i mean the clouds look like they're whipped cream again i mean the clouds the trees look like they're whipped cream but it, it's like they got this dark like ooh, mystery um you know corners the corners of this are very very dark so we get this light shaft here in the middle to focus all of our attention on that girl in the dress okay again it's meant to be silly and saucy and fete galant and flirtatious and that's the point of this picture all right it's a depiction of rich people and that's what they're going to want is the aristocracy are going to want pictures about themselves doing silly and frivolous things other pictures from this time are are you know going off and having picnics out in the out in the countryside, you know, just rich people. And, oh, oh, oh. and that's kind of the point of what's happening in these pieces. So this is The Swing um, by Fragonard, 1767. And you've seen this, of course, before in Frozen, that moment uh, when Anna is singing to the pictures and singing to the paintings and whatnot. And um, it's a little edited in the Disney version because first of all, the guy is just pushing her. He's, he's actually touching her gasp. Um, he's not pulling on swings and the other, the boyfriend has been edited out and it's just meant to be this, like uh, this carefree. Oops. I lost my shoe. Um, the swing is going to come back to haunt us later. We're going to see another piece in the late, uh, 20th, early 21st century that is created as a response to this piece. So keep the swing in the back of your mind because this is going to come back to haunt you. Okay. So this is the epitome of the Rococo. Okay. It is um, natural. It is, but it is lighthearted. Again, the intentional use of those soft colors and the ornate details, the layers and layers and layers in the, in the, undergrowth in the woods in her dress and the use of those lines okay the light directs us towards that girl who is sitting on the swing so again it's an intrigue painting it's a painting about flirtations about sauciness about um trysts all right at this time period the nobility of France is living better than the population and they're living quite decadently, okay? This is all gonna play into the revolution that's coming just around the corner, all right? Um, yikes. All right, now this is a, a Francois Boucher. Boucher is another Rococo artist. And I throw this one in here, again, it's not on our list, but I throw it in here, you don't have to know it, but because um, it's, well, for a couple reasons. It's another indicative piece of the Rococo. Again, this painting is very small. It's a very small picture because again, Rococo pictures are not going to be these grand, um, you know, theater size dramas. They're not, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to be just small and intimate and fun. Um, what's happening in this picture is called the young lovers. And you have these uh, nobles who are dressed as peasants who are again, out in a wild uh, fete galant style, like countryside picnic 
with the wild animals around. They've got these goats. You know, they're, they're goat herds. They're pretending to be goat herds out here in the country, having a picnic with their little basket and just, you know, enjoying time together. I throw this one in here because this was owned by the Utah Museum of Fine Art. And it made international news uh, at the beginning of the 21st century because what happened was the Utah Museum of Fine Art obtained this picture, obtained this boucher from a source. You know, they it, it was purchased legally at some point. Uh, come to find out that because someone comes forward to claim this picture, if this was owned by a Jewish family in Europe, at the time of the Second World War, and it was stolen by the Nazis and um, never returned to the family that it was stolen from. And so it wound up in someone else's collection after World War II, and then it got sold and sold, and, you know, a couple times, and it winds up at the Museum of Fine Art in Utah in Salt Lake City. And so it made news then when a family member comes forward and says this and with documentation to show yet this was ours and it was stolen. Um, and so what happens and the Utah Museum of Fine Art gives it back to the family and then has since become committed to they've committed to uh, restoring works stolen by Nazis, the Nazis into the proper families that own them. Okay. So this was given back to the family um, and is no longer in the collection of the Utah Museum of Fine Art. But its story, I think, is in its it's powerful. It's a powerful moment of restitution. And um, it's cool, I think. So that's why we throw Francois Boucher's The Young Lovers into this discussion. The Utah Museum of Fine Art is also going to exhibit this picture. Okay, now this is by uh, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. All right. And she is going to be uh, admitted to the Academy. She's going to be admitted to the Salon, and she is going to be one of the powerhouses of French uh, Rococo art. All right. And she is painting. Oh, she just paints so beautifully. Her, the eyes of her figure. She's a portrait painter, and she just paints so beautifully. Um, the UMFA has other examples of her work as well, and she's she was quite prolific. Here at the end of the 18th century, she does become a favorite of Marie Antoinette. All right, a favorite painter, and Marie. She's going to paint Marie Antoinette and the children multiple times. Okay, and she gets admitted to the academy because of Marie Antoinette's urgings. Um, when after the revolution, Vigée Le Brun is going to have to flee France. She's going to have to flee Paris to because she's you know connected with the royalty, and so she's got to get out of Dodge. So she takes her daughter and leaves, and she's the breadwinner. She's the um, she does she is married for a time has a daughter and then her husband like gambles away all of her money. She's the breadwinner because she's this uh, very successful portrait painter, which is unusual at the time because she is a woman. Um, she's able to then um, divorce her husband, take her daughter and then travel around Europe. And she's going to paint the nobility and the aristocracy and the royalty around Europe for the rest of her life. And so here she is painting a princess as the goddess of spring, Flora. Okay. And this is in the collection of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm going to link this video um, in the description below. And this is just the National Gallery talking about, the, uh, in Washington, D.C., talking about Vigée Le Brun. She's going to be, again, very, very prolific. She's going to paint a lot because this is how she earns her living. And she, but she paints very, very beautifully. Now, again, in the Rococo style, not quite so silly or soft, but just very beautifully. This is her self-portrait, and this is the piece that AP wants us to see. 
You can see that she is, um, this is not a great reproduction. I apologize. It's rather dark, this image, and the image itself is not actually this dark. She paints herself um, painting. She's doing her self-portrait uh, painting. And so this is in 1790. She's going to be painting the a picture of Marie Antoinette. In this picture that she's painting of herself, she's painting Marie Antoinette. And this is after Marie has died. Um, and she's painting a picture of her. Again, to show other people's that she is or was <laughs> well-connected. Okay. Um, she paints herself mid speaking. She's turning her head to give a response and she's opening her mouth to respond, you know, just to the conversation that she's having. She holds palette and brushes in her hand. She does uh, wear rich clothes. She is lavishly dressed with the lace, the lace collars, um, her hair caught up uh, to keep it out of her eyes. And then the, the rich satin bow, uh, the red satin bow behind her. It is a little, um, again, it's it's not quite as dark as this, but we're getting a little of that. Um, but you see the softness of the Rococo in her hair, in her frills, uh, in her smile. All right. So this is Vijay Lebrun's self-portrait. It's a return to these naturalistic ideas, and she's going to be um, active. And she's going to, in this portrait, she depicts herself as actively painting, actively speaking, actively engaged. And so she, the portrait is very engaging in that way because it, she engages with us and she looks directly at us and she's, she's speaking mid-sentence. Um, mid Not many female artists were allowed in the salon, in the academy at the time. Okay, so she was rare in that sense. And she worked specifically, like I said, for Marie Antoinette. Um, she paints just very lavishly, very beautifully. If you Google Vigée Le Brun, you're not going to be disappointed because her stuff is just spectacular. All right. Now, that's the Rococo. Now, the Enlightenment it's going to be seen as anti-Rococo, okay? Up in England, they are going to look at what's happening in France and be like, mm. um, this is the time of Isaac Newton and John Locke and other <laughs> philosophers, uh, Voltaire, Rousseau. You know, we're, we're having, again, a flowering of philosophy happen. Uh, nature, science, observation, um, is all intellect, reason, that's all very, very important to them. And they're going to respond artistically to the, to the Rococo period that's happening in France at this time. So in England, um, what we're going to be seeing, it's a the Industrial Revolution is happening. The American Revolution is happening. Um, they're going to be influenced by um, by science. They're going to obviously be influenced by the Baroque, by the old masters, and the the it's called the Grand Manner uh, paintings that are incorporating these visual metaphors uh, for noble qualities. All right, good family values. Um, that's kind of what, what they're going to want to show to be very serious instead of the silliness and the softness of the Rococo. Okay. So up in England, we're going to be getting a couple, um, scientific style paintings. Now this is Joseph Wright of, of Derby, 1765. And this is the philosopher giving the lecture at the orrery. And so what we're seeing here is a philosopher, a lecturer, and he's giving a talk. He's talking about science, very serious science, um, around an orrery. Now, an orrery is this. It's a model of the solar system. Okay. 
So you can see here that the people are gathered around and they're contemplating his words. His words are being uh, taken down. They're taking dictation, taking notes, and he's looking on to see if they're being written down correctly. And the other people are looking either at him or at the orrery itself. The children are kind of are like reaching in to, to like touch it. Um, the philosopher is based on Isaac Newton. Okay. And that's done on purpose where he, we're getting this very Isaac Newton esque look to, to him. Now you'll notice that Joseph Wright of Derby is painting this in a tenebristic style. He's using tenebrism, which is Baroque, um, in this picture. And he's showing us this, he's doing this because, um, well, Baroque, always had that spiritual connotation that the light, that the extreme shadow and light had spiritual connotations of like the, the light of God. All right. What he's doing here is he's replacing the light of God with the light of science and the light of knowledge. All right. And the, the source of the light sits behind this figure's head. It's right here, the source of the light, but it's also, it's a light bulb. It's a gas light. It's not a light bulb. It's a gas light, but it's acting as the sun in the orrery. It's the sun in the solar system model that's illuminated, right? Now, and again, you can see how they are in a, a library of sorts, a study, a very, again, serious place. The faces, as we move around the picture, now check this out. They're the faces of the moon. So we get a full face illuminated, a waxing gibbous, half moon, new moon, crescent moon, half moon, full moon. Okay. So, which is really cool. They did that again, that's done on purpose. And it, it's got this great elliptical um, composition that just kind of leads us out. You see the philosopher first, his gaze casts, casts us down. He's looking down, which brings us to here. His hat and his look bring us, shoot us over here to see the kids. And then brings us to the dark figure, the silhouette, who we follow this dark line down and up and catch his gaze and come up like back and around and through. Okay. So again, it's this elliptical orbit of the moon around the earth and the phases of the moon um, reflected in the faces of the listeners to the lecture. Okay. So I'll link this video uh, in the description below. All right, talking about it. So they're using tenebrism, but they're, they're talking about the, the light of science, the light of knowledge, rather than the light of God. So that lamp, again, is the sun. And it demonstrates the importance, the role of science. So again, this is compared to the Rococo, which is very soft and silly. And this is a very serious painting about very serious things. Okay. Um, so there it is. Joseph Wright of Derby giving a lecture at the orrery. When I was in Chicago, same conference, I was looking for a specific painting in the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. And I turned a corner and but there was this charcoal self portrait of Joseph Wright of Derby. And here he is. So I snapped that photo. So you can see what it looks like. Now our last picture here in the Rococo is a satire. This is a funny picture. This is a, f it's meant, it's intended to be a joke. This is Taya Te from a series of pictures called Marriage a la Mode by William Hogarth, 1743. And this is playing, it's making fun of the Rococo movement. It's making fun of the Rococo style. What's happening here is they're making fun of these nouveau riche people, these new rich people, these young aristocrats that are up and coming and are frivoling or frittering away their money, their fri frivolous, uh, the frivolities, they are squandering their cash. 
And so what we're seeing here are, <laughs> you can tell this is the, it's called the breakfast scene. Um, it's the next day. It's the day after the big party. You get the two young aristocrats and they are in their drawing room about to have morning tea. She, he slumps in his chair, dejected. Wife is stretching with a grin on her face. Butler, advisor, throws up his hands and walks away. Chair is knocked over with a violin and music out, books out, sword out, uh, paper strewn. There's a guy in the background that is um, getting up. You can see his, his stockings have fallen down from his knees. They're kind of around his calves. And he's picking up this chair as he's getting up because he passed out there drunk the night before. You're getting, oh gosh, this picture is so rich with details. I can't even begin to tell you <laughs> the story. So the story is, is that they have um, had this raucous, wild night, this crazy party the night before. Um, she, again, is... Ah, slyly glancing over to her husband. She had a good time. She had a good night. Okay. Now, if we scroll down, we'll notice that, again, he has not. Now that we've got the dog, and the dog is sniffing something in the pocket of the coat pocket of the man whose hands are in his pockets. And he's, again, sitting dejectedly down, looking. He did not have a good night. Now, they did not spend the night together, okay? And that's important to know. They did not spend the night together. She was with another man and he was with another woman. And we know that that is because she looks like the cat that ate the canary. I mean, she had a great time. He did not. And we know that he was with somebody else because he's got this bonnet in his pocket, this woman's hat in her, you know, hair covering in his pocket that is not his wife's because the dog is smelling it because it smells different. All right. And we know that he did not have a good night because if we look at the sword, we'll see that the sword has been broken. We know what a sword represents. Okay. Um, but the sword here depicted is broken so that he is, again, did not have a fulfilling evening the night before. We're shown the worldliness of this family by the influence of, or the, the inclusion of, on the mantelpiece, the Buddhas here on the clock and here on the mantelpiece. And you've got these little frog statues, these other like little figurines from around the world, but including these Buddha figures to show that they are well-traveled, that they are have been around the world. Um, the allusions to music are also, music in the European tradition is very frequently related to the idea of sensuality and sex, and that they are going to, um, yeah, the music is naughty, okay? So we have the picture of the little Cupid there playing music, and then that's where we have the violin down here on this chair, okay, out with on the overturned chair because it was a night of merrymaking and sauciness, okay, with the music just, ah, flagrantly there. Now, this guy here what he's doing he's holding a ledger you know like keeping track of the money he's helping keep track he's the accountant okay he helps keep track of their monies and you can see that this is the little stabby thing for bills paid and these are all the bills that remain unpaid and he walks away in disgust, throwing up, back up his hands because there he says, it's time to pay the bills. And they're like, no, no, not now, Jeeves, go away. 
And he's like, I'm sick of this. I can't deal with you people anymore because you're so ridiculous. Um, the other indications of a night poorly spent, we've got the candles burning low, like still burning. It's the morning. The candles are still burning. Okay. Guy yawning and scratching his head. And his, again, his stockings falling down as he picks himself up from his drunken stupor on the floor. Um, up in the, in the background, then we're getting pictures of the saints. Okay. We have saints and angels depicted here in the, oh, more candles lit. Ha. Uh, in, on the wall to show that they are good, pious Christian people. Yes. Oh, ho, ho. Here in the dining room. But if we go next to it, here is a saucy picture a flirtatious nude that is hung a la Titian's Venus of Urbino. Okay. And it's hung behind a curtain that only gets uncovered, you know, on poker night kind of things, or when it's a, uh, uh, you know, a saucy night, let's say. Okay. So it gets uncovered on guys night. Um, right. But you so see, you can see the little foot here exposed because it was being viewed that day. So what this picture is doing is, again, it's making fun of that aristocracy. It's making fun of the Rococo. It's making fun of the Nouveau Riche and saying, you people are ridiculous. And you live this like flirty, gross lifestyle that's going to end you. And this series of pictures shows like how it ends in ruin, that living this life is going to lead to nowhere good, that it's all going to be end in disaster because you're going to end up with disease and you're going to end up and you're going to die because of your wicked, um, frivolous ways. All right. So he's poking fun of William Hogarth is poking fun at the aristocracy. Right, so it is a narrative picture, and it is highly satirical. It's meant to be funny. He's using the colors and the form of the Rococo to poke fun at the Rococo. All right. So this is uh, the Teate from Marriage a la Mode. And this is, um, our, these are our pieces today. So I hope you enjoyed this little trip in the Rococo and the Enlightenment. Next time we'll do the Neoclassical.